This slide shows a simplified overview of the five patterns. As people move from left to right, their analysis skills get stronger and stronger and stronger. The movement of conclusions, however, is a little less linear. People start out as confused fact finders, unable to reach their own conclusions. And then as biased jumpers, they go to the other extreme, they're overly strong conclusions. Then they move back as perpetual analyzers to be unable to reach conclusions. And then as pragmatic performers, then they finally can say, okay, now I can have strong conclusions that are well-founded. And then finally, they can add the ability to address limitations methodically, go about learning new knowledge over time as strategic revisioners. I believe overall that professors give perpetual analyzers poor grades. In fact, I think they give them worse grades than bias jumpers because of their inability to reach and strongly defend a conclusion. This might be one of the reasons why the majority of students seem to stall at the bias jumper stage. And I think it's one of the big issues that we need to address in higher education. I've been accounting professor by training. What you are seeing now are the distributions of thinking patterns in four individual accounting classrooms. On the left are two undergraduate sophomore level introductory financial accounting classrooms. And on the right are two MBA introductory financial accounting classrooms. The way to read these charts is to start with a darker color on the bottom which indicates the proportion of students in each classroom operating as a confused fact finder. You'll notice that it's a fairly small percent in one of the sophomore classes, while it is fairly high, over 20%, in the other sophomore level class. It was close to 10% in each of the two MBA classes. The next higher area in the, in the bar is the lighter colored area representing the proportion of students operating as a biased jumper. You will notice that this is the largest group in all four classrooms, especially the MBA classroom on the far right. The next higher area in, in a medium color represents the proportion of students operating as perpetual analyzers. And then the very top dark color represents the pragmatic performers. In these four classrooms, none of the students were operating as strategic revisioners. You might have noticed that one of the sophomore level classes looks very abnormal. And you're right. This was a group of students in a summer class. And they were taking the class in the summer because they were particularly strong students who were moving through the business degree program more quickly than other students. They were not a normal group of students. I wanted to share this example with you because it can be very helpful, even if you're teaching the same course repeatedly, to assess the thinking skills in each classroom. Students in one classroom might have a distribution that is quite different than in the same course at a different point in time. I personally use classroom assignments for assessment so that I can get a sense of the distribution and that helps me do a better job of making sure that I provide learning activities that challenge and support students operating at different levels. These days, I'm not a full-time professor and I tend to teach individual courses at different schools around the world. For example, this year I'm teaching two courses at a university in Finland. Doing assessments are essential in helping me get to know students in a new program or for a new course. It's really helpful to have an assignment due early in the course to help me gauge the patterns of thinking. I told you that we would come back later and look at the Steps for Better Thinking diagram once again. You'll notice at the bottom of the diagram is what I call the foundation or knowing. That's the, the big body of knowledge. And unfortunately, too many classrooms, in, in, even in university levels, courses tend to focus almost exclusively on, on knowledge. If we want students to develop better thinking skills, we have to also focus on what I call the step one, two, 
three and four skills. And these are the skills that we really care about today. If I have students who are operating as confused fact finders and I give them a learning task at step one, that skill is above their current abilities and they'll probably struggle working on it, but they are capable of learning it. If I give them learning activities, however, that are targeting step two, such as asking them to discuss the pros and cons of Obamacare, I have given them a task that is too far beyond their ability. Anything above step one is too difficult for them. I like the term scaffolding that you see on this slide. And you might notice when you look at the diagram that inside the steps there is scaffolding. I like to think of the scaffolding as partly the student's responsibility and partly the professor's or the learning development person's responsibility. We as educators and developers can help our students scaffold stronger skills. And uh, there's also an elevator on the right hand side of this diagram. The idea is that an individual person when working on a problem might go back and forth among the steps and periodically go down to the knowledge foundation and so on in a non-linear fashion. In other words, we don't start with knowledge at the bottom and then go to step one and then step two and so on. We don't think linearly. The elevator helps convey this idea of non-linearity. Some of the keys that I believe are important is first, to, I assess my students' thinking skills so that I can gain insight into the distribution for the class. And then I need to give my students lots of open-ended problems. And open-ended problems have multiple viable, reasonable conclusions. If I'm not giving my students open-ended problems, then I'm not giving them opportunities to develop these higher level thinking skills. At the same time, I don't want to over challenge my students. If I have a lot of bias jumpers in my classroom, then spending a lot of time on steps three and four is a waste of everybody's time. I need to target my learning activities to maximize the likelihood that development will take place. I also need to provide plenty of guidance and support. So let's pause here for a final polling question. At this point, I assume that you have questions, so I've tried to anticipate what some of those might be, and that's what the next poll is about. I'm now showing you the results of the poll. 47% of you said that you would like to learn more about how to assess these thinking skills, and 41% would like to know more about how you could help students or others develop stronger thinking skills. And some of you had a few other questions. Here are some resources that might be helpful. If you've not already been to my website, the address is shown at the top of the screen. It's www.walcottlynch.com. Under the Educator Resources tab on my website, you'll find a lot of documents that provide more information. And one of the, the things that you will see information about is a faculty handbook. I don't post the faculty handbook on my website, but there's a link where you can send me an email to request it. I will send it free of charge to anyone who requests it. Under the listserv tab, you can sign up for my listserv. This will ensure that you learn about future webinars and any new materials that become available. You don't need to worry about receiving tons of listserv email messages. There are usually only a few emails per year on my listserv. The other website I would like to tell you about is something I recently learned, discovered for the first time. And this website contains materials that are adapted from my, my website and from my faculty handbook. And the creators have used those materials and turned it into a tutorial. You can refer your students to this site and have them work on, on the skills for steps one, two, three, and four. Although I don't think they call them those numbers on the website, I think they refer to the words identifying, exploring, prioritizing, and revisioning. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for participating in today's workshop, and I look forward to possibly having you participate in a future workshop. Thank you.